Hey everybody, welcome to Tuesday, and we're talking about choice in video games today. Something I think a lot about. And uh, to me, the a lot of the discussions um, regarding choice and philosophy of choice in video games create some some false binaries about what choice does and what freedom of choice actually is um you know there's there's freedom of choice but then there's making choices feel meaningful in games and in in some ways you know wild freedom of choice makes each choice feel less significant if that makes any sense and i think a lot of people, when they talk about choices in games, too often they just think of narrative choices, of choices you make that affect the plot. And sometimes I think those are, you know, really overvalued in terms of meaning of choice. I know with the Far Cry games, the Far Cry games really made me more aware of what choices in gameplay do for the experience. You know, the the those games ability uh to to let you choose how to take out each checkpoint and each fort and you know uh yeah it it, it funnels you in places for the campaign story, but those are great fuck around and find out games. I know I'm not using that the way it's intended to be used, but you know what I mean? Um, the, the, the joy of the Far Cry games is the journey of what weapons you choose, what armor you choose, what, um, you know, what animal friends in later games you use. Chicharron is the correct answer. Uh, no, as such, I liked all the, all the amigos in Far Cry 6 in their own way, and I give them kudos for that. Um, because Chicharron is so good. Um, but, um, you know, when we get back to narrative choice, which is the thing most people focus on, which I think is is actually kind of disappointing because one of the one of the things I find is really getting weak in AAA games is the whole loot thing. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, armor equip mechanics. I find more and more in games, I ended up not swapping out armor all that much just because I find it makes so little difference. And cosmetically, there are very few games that make me want to change outfits regularly on a character. Saints Row was one of them because it was it was part of the whole world, right? Like the, these, they're a bunch of assholes, the Saints, and so they did have that very, you know, superficial image conscious element to it. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna you know put on an outfit and do the Genki Bowl, you know. Um, th that that game made me made me want to immerse by changing outfits but a lot of the time things like armor sets are either sort of tedious exercises in min maxing or it's just sort of why i mean this is all right i guess and i i get that some people really really like those customization features i just find they become less meaningful as you play more games and i do think that there are ways to make the um those choices those mechanical choices in games feel more intuitively meaningful like yeah there are the achievements you know kill kill 50 enemies in the style kill 100 enemies in the style kill uh uh, you know, with this weapon, that weapon, whatever. Yes, but I think there are more clever ways of making those choices part of the direct experience instead of just achievement chasing. Um, but that's, I mean, 
every game only has so much time and so much money, so that is not an insult um, to any game. It's just, I... One of the things about AAA games that I will probably never be able to do directly because I am too big a personality for AAA games um, is have those really big budgets to go crazy with that stuff and actually experiment with the philosophy of some of that stuff. So I like when, um, you know, Sunset Overdrive, I thought, was another one that really sort of made the look of the character into part of the experience and that uh, I hope that game gets sort of a second life through Game Pass because um, it was a very early cycle title and a lot of people missed it and I found it a heck of a, heck of a ton a heck of a ton of fun a heck of a ton of fun heck of a lot of fun um, but getting into narrative choices plot choices um there are two main components to an in-game choice. And I guess this is true of like weapons and armor choices too. You got a sense of control, but then you've got that feeling of experiencing consequences. And a lot of talk is on the control element of game choices, being able to, you know, make the world do you know, what interact with the world, make it feel meaningful, enact your will in this fictional setting. But that consequence element is, I think, really overlooked in discussions about this stuff. I know there is a lot of debate within game designer circles about um, appropriate consequences and how to balance it. Um you know, beyond the whole you have died accessible games thing. Um, uh, you know, like a, the those sort of sweet spot Bioware games, Dragon Age Origins, first couple Mass Effect games. thing that was cool about those is, I mean, shit happened at times. Like, you know, you get to the end of Mass Effect 2 and you know, party members can die. That was like, whoa. Um, you know, the, the Witcher 3 was great for meaningful consequences in games. I mean, the, the Witcher is a very nihilistic world, but th they really did cool things at times about, well, this is kind of awful, but it's different shades of awful. And... I maintain The Witcher 3 did a better job of making, uh, of choosing the moments where the characters took over and you couldn't make a choice. There were times in Witcher 2 that it just felt downright frustrating that all of a sudden there, there was this, this sometimes you made the choices for Geralt and sometimes he just went freaking rogue and did things on his own. It's like, you know, what, what's, happening here this is this is weird why 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 am i suddenly a passenger you know whereas the moments in three where the player it was taken out of the player's hands it felt less to me and and i'd be interesting if other people had a completely different experience this way but you know it was more oh yennefer and goes and does something or um Philippa Eilhart goes and does something and you can't stop them. It's not that Geralt chooses to not stop them. You can't. And that felt less like all of a sudden this character I was supposed to be making choices for went rogue. Um, you know, compared to, for instance, Horizon Forbidden West, where, yeah, you're making dialogue choices, but after a while you realize... They don't do anything. They don't go anywhere. Nothing happens because you chose a dialogue option. And to me, that sucked a lot of the enjoyment out of the, the dialogue in Horizon Forbidden West because so much of it was superfluous. You didn't have to pay attention to it. And I, I still think that game was affected in its development by covid um, 
to the point that I'm I'm almost thinking about going back and playing the original Horizon Zero Dawn to see if it really was as good as I remember it or whether it's like a false memory that I've just become pickier. Um, but I suspect it is as good as I remember it and stuff just happened with Forbidden West. I'll play another game precisely because of COVID, but the 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 arp the the dialogue rpg portions of horizon forbidden west are the absolute weakest part of the game because okay you make choices you control what aloy does but it doesn't matter there's no impact there's no consequence right as opposed to those you know few wild moments in Dragon Age Origins where, you know, you could argue, well, they're really false binary choices, but sometimes binary choices work because it makes them harder and therefore more satisfying and more meaningful, you know, and you have to choose between Alistair and Taryn Loghain and it it was really hard for me to choose Loghain over Alistair the one time out of like four I managed to do it just to see what happened. But you know what? As much as it's not my preferred storyline, because I just love Alistair in that game, the the Loghain path was spectacular. Really, really well written. Worth the pain of making that choice. As opposed to, again, the, the um, completely random choice you make off the top of the Witcher 2 where you have to choose the Roach path and the Orvith path and it affects the rest of your gameplay and I people have argued that the po choice is completely random and that's the point but it didn't work for me because I there wasn't enough meat to make the choice and I didn't know it would affect the whole game but I was just like, I don't know. I don't like either of you. Why? And I guess that's a very Geralt thing. But I just didn't see from the perspective of the character, even though Roach was kind of a dick, you thought he was essentially a decent dude. There was really no reason to go with Yorvith at that point. You find out later completely different than how it was presented. But... It it did it didn't feel like an informed consequential choice, not like, you know, you have this really solid argument for going with Taryn Logan. You have this really solid argument and an emotional one for keeping Alistair in the party. There's a lot to work with in that choice. There's no right or wrong answer, but you feel it. There's an emotional consequence there. Whereas with Roach, Yorvith, I don't fucking care. You know, your path in the game is to me the far superior one, um, which kind of sucks because obviously. Now, there are completely arbitrary choices like the one at the beginning of Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem that work because the whole point narrative wise is that this poor, poor pious Augustus picks a colored totem and that basically seals his fate for thousands of years of torture at, at the the hands of a Lovecraftian god. No offense, Cthulhu. Um, you know, that that the randomness is the point. He Pius Augustus, I think that's his name, is the antagonist through most of the game and yet because you saw how he began you saw how it was just sort of a twist of fate that put him there it humanized a lich which i thought was kind of cool what's up liches um a joke never gets old because it was never good um let's talk about control there because that not enough data, right? Not enough information to make a choice is a form of control, right? And there are times where it is appropriate to take control away from the player. Um, sometimes a choice 
wants to be open-ended. The developer wants there to be no right, right or wrong answers, just the experience you want. Other times, it is totally fair for a developer to make something of a point in the story, the way Ghost of Tsushima does, right? There are there are points where the the choice is taken away from the player because in in reality the choice is kind of taken away from Jin. Um, it's either do something or all you know his entire people die essentially or are subjugated like game over. And I know there was a lot of debate about some of those choices where it's wrested away from the player. Um, and this is subjective, but it worked for me precisely because um, the more I thought about it, the more I guess you could do a thing where Jin chooses not to do the bad thing, but then everybody gets slaughtered, hidden ending, back to the point where you make the choice. I guess you could do that. Um, but that that to me is not necessary. Um, it's a different choice philosophy. In in some games like Nier Automata, those sort of hidden endings work really well, right? Those are fun. You you try to do things. Once you figure out there are those little hidden endings, you do things to try to figure out what's going to happen, right? But then there are times where like I said in The Witcher 2, um, resting control away from the player just doesn't work. It's a frustrating experience. It feels like you're you're hijacking a choice that should be the players to make. But also sometimes taking control away makes the care makes the player care less. Um, some of you may remember my Last of Us Two playthrough on Twitch and the moment where Ellie beats Nora to death with, I forget some sort of bludgeoning object that wasn't a golf club. Um, but that scene actively made me angry. I sat there trying to figure out a less horrific way to do that. And I thought that, that was a moment they should have, you, you you can, Nora is dead no matter what because she's infected, right? But you could choose to make it a quick death, you know, back up and shoot her in the head. You can choose to just leave her there for the spores to take her. Or you can choose to do what Ellie did, which was brutally beat a character who happened to be black to death in a fit of rage and any other game where that was a mechanic while the black lives matter protests were going on. I guarantee you any other game would have gotten hot takes written about that scene by the dozens, but because you know, the last of us two is a, you know, leftist approved franchise for some odd reason, people didn't go, what's going on here? Like, why is Ellie just a brutal killer? And the lack of choice in The Last of Us 2, actually, I rebelled so hard against the game making me complicit in moments like that by making me hit a button. It's like, you're not making me feel anything but angry because it isn't my choice to do this. You're forcing me to do this. So I feel no moral responsibility here. You're not making me feel sad. You're not making me feel oh, this is awful. You're pissing me off that you're railroading me here. And I rebelled so hard against the lack of choice in a game that was very clearly preaching some sort of message that got extremely muddled that I did things like, you know, I, I discovered in one point, no matter where you fell off into the river, Ad Abby's head would hit the exact same rock in the exact same way. That's where the Amir the Rock meme came from. 
And so I just kept throwing her off in different places to see this one like really grisly death animation. And I laughed and I laughed like complete dissonance, right? Like complete breaking of immersion. And there was another part with the Ellie and Abby fight where I'm just like, fuck you. Like you're making me fight Ellie. You have made Ellie the bad guy here. I'm not going to do it. So I just got, was it, I forget, maybe it was uh, fighting as Ellie, as Abby, but I just got whoever I was playing killed as many different ways as possible. Um, the death animations are pretty good in that scene, but just did it deliberately because the fact that I don't even remember which character was it, it was, I thought it was just funny to to get them shot in the face. And other things like that because I was so and I am not like that. I am not. I have like so much empathy for things and like I, I get really upset when they and that was the thing. I was so past my misery threshold in that game that it turned me into an asshole, which was not obviously not the intent of the game. A little bit more choice in some of those moments would have felt a greater attachment, but it was just misery porn where you were pushing buttons. And choices don't have to matter to the grand plot. I've talked a lot about how much I love the dialogue system in the Yakuza games. And it's the it's the experience. You get you get like XP, you get some progression no matter how badly you screw up. Now, if you do better with like, you know, the, the hostess bars, you get more XP, you get more approval from the girls, but it gives you so many chances to catch up that it it really doesn't matter, right? Same with like the mini games and, and all that stuff. But the the choices, the the you can sort of figure out what the responses are going to be, but sometimes they surprise you. So there is this wonderful, giddy, gleeful, I want to see what happens with this. And to me, that's the sweet spot with RPG style dialogue writing. Because we all know at this point with video games, it's very rare that, that you know... um dialogue's going to make a huge impact on the plot certain games that allow you i i played uh torment tides of tides of uh oh is it numenara or numaria or something like that but i played it high charisma score like high persuasion score um so i avoided a lot of fights and it was it was kind of a dry experience which was disappointing because i loved the idea of it but, you know, dialogue, much like dialogue in real real life, shouldn't be about getting it perfect all the time, right? It should be, oh, we're learning about these characters, especially playing as Kiryu. It's so fun to screw up in Yakuza games. And there's an example of choices that are completely emotionally purposed, Right? It is purely an emotional reward. It is purely an emotional consequence. And I know there are some people that say, well, there's no point of a choice in, unless there's a meaning, meaning some kind of game mechanic. And I know there are other people saying the minute there is a reward in a video game, it's not a moral choice. It's min-maxing. And that that's the... Um, that's the part that I, I, I see the point, but I sort of quibble with it because accepting consequences is part of moral frameworks. There is sometimes an emotional payoff in a game to do the right thing, even if it means, you know, you don't get a cool piece of armor or you don't, you know, max things out. There's rewards in other ways, like, you know, uh, you get somebody who's your friend instead of power, right? Like, 
suffering somewhat having like sometimes punishments in games feel good because the sacrifice gives you a sense that it's more tangible and obviously this stuff has to be play tested and focus grouped and and really thought about and you know and and this is this is where we get into my final point about this whole choice thing is the the buzzword right now in subverting expectations right you hear all subverting expectations we wanted to subvert expectations too often that's done with a bludgeon and it doesn't work subverting expectations has to be done um the witcher 3 endings did it well in places i mean i was really surprised because i I was nice to Triss and, you know, I ended up getting like the dad Geralt ending where Triss is the one going out and working and Geralt's basically a house husband because he's retired from being a witcher and he passes the sword on to Ciri because she's the new witcher. And I'm like, this doesn't feel at all in character. This is not what I was expecting from an end to a witcher game. But, you know, him, him ending up with Triss is so non-canonical from the books it was sort of a huh all right so road not taken um Triss is you know the less exciting between her and Yennefer but I I always got the sense that the Witcher 3 was saying yes Yennefer is more exciting Yennefer is an amazing character but I really got the sense that her and Geralt were just bad for each other in part because they were stuck with each other right because that whole curse on thing um so that was an example of subverting expectations in a way they they persuaded me right um then you get the subverting expectations that you usually get i mean uh, some of the the dragon age endings did a good job before they started getting diluted with the ea takeover the dragon age and mass effect endings um they were always bittersweet. There were always trade-offs with the factions you helped. And so, you know, you, you, it was, I don't know if it was possible to get a win at all things, you know, um, you, you I, I ended up sort of splitting down the middle with the, the Geth and the Canari and, and ended up sort of, but that was tough, man. There was a lot of shuttle diplomacy there. Um, but there, there were choices where you had to sort of pick one or the other, um, you know, the Ashes of Andraste choice, stuff like that. And so sometimes the result of the choice was unexpected, but it was kind of, oh, okay, that's neat because, you know, there were other good things as well. But that's not what you tend to hear talked about regarding subverting expectations. What subverting expectations tends to mean when it gets thrown around in the games media is breaking emotional bonds that players have formed with characters. And that should be done very sparingly. I mean, I think Gears of War 3 did it well when they killed off Dom. Because when you think you think back more and more and more, the 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 choice he makes there really makes sense and and the juxtaposition with all the other characters works even though it kills you i mean in a lot of ways dom's the moral core of that that foursome um but that one worked in, in part because you know the, the that wing of the story was for all intents and purposes over and there's a a um example of when they give you a choice in the newer games i'm like well this is kind of bullshit it didn't work as well as the 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 railroaded death in in the original trilogy of gears um but again that it was the message behind it it was what you were supposed to take away it was sort of the the moral of the story right that loss sometimes it not being a choice works better. Then there's killing Joel at 
the beginning of The Last of Us 2. And I, I want to tell you why I think people had such a strong reaction to that. It, it wasn't because expectations were subverted. It's because the first game was Joel and Ellie. And both Joel and Ellie mattered to that story. It was their story. It was the us in The Last of Us. Without those two, in the minds of a lot of people, including me, it's not really a Last of Us game anymore. Like, give us three games with those two before that happens, right? That's not subverting an expectation. That's breaking players' emotional connection with the IP. And... Joel was never a character I related to, which is part of why I liked him. But I thought he worked very, very well the way they used him in, in those games. And it just really was not the same without him. It's like when they try to do Halo games without Master Chief. It's just not the same. I, I actually thought that when Halo 2 had Chief and the Arbiter in that arc, and then they took the Arbiter away, I started losing interest in Halo because I found the Arbiter's story arc much more compelling than Master Chief's. And there there are DNA of stories, you know. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the Uncharted franchise now because um, I think they could make it work with Nathan Drake's daughter if they're very careful and and Nathan Drake moves into the Sully role. But you have to be really careful when you subvert expectations and and you you deny the choice to can, you know, you you deny what people like about it. And this is true of choice and railroaded things. You cannot break the emotional connection that the player has with the game. Period, end of story. People won't, it, it's bad subverting of expectations. It's not good subverting of expectations, right? You have to find a way to make a player feel that loss and allow them to maintain emotional connection instead of getting so pissed off that they just, nope, check out emotionally. Um, so there you go. I'm interested in your thoughts about choice in games. Again, I prefer it when people add to the conversation instead of, you are wrong, gar, 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 tangent about something I didn't actually say, right? Um, I, I like hearing other people's opinions. I like contrasting viewpoints. Um, I like other sides. Let, him, let me have it. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Or buy a one-time Leanna Care session for someone who can use it but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K. I think I forgot to do this off the top. Thanks for watching.